Hello and welcome to Southside Sunday School. I'm Joe Farless and I'll be leading us through the lesson today. If you'd like to uh, open your Bibles to uh, John chapter 9, the Gospel according to John. We'll be in, in uh, chapter 9 today. Uh, we'll be going through uh, various verses, but we'll be beginning at uh, uh, John 9, verse 1, and reading down through verse 7. Then we'll switch to 32 and 33. But I'll tell you about that when we get to that point. The title of our lesson today, or the, or the session, is um, Jesus Opened My Eyes to the Truth. And the point of the lesson is, is Jesus led me to increasingly see who He is. We're going to see today, uh, it's the story of the blind man that Jesus healed on the Sabbath and um, uh, healed him of his blindness. Uh, when uh, We'll get into the story in, in just a moment, but I want to uh, uh, want to ask you, uh, when you became a Christian, were you uh, fully born? I'm not talking about our salvation and everything. Certainly through our salvation, Jesus Christ, there's nothing left for us to do. Uh, much like the thief on the cross, uh, Jesus told him that today you'll be with me in paradise. But I'm talking about, um, take me for instance, okay? When um, I was born again, I had a lot of uh, uh, living under my belt. I had followed the ways of the world for a little while, and the truths of the scripture were just being opened to me. Um, and I learned about the Ten Commandments, although I'd heard about the Ten Commandments, but I'd learned more about the Ten Commandments, and it was, it was a little bit scary. So I tried to conform my life to following those Ten Commandments, which, of course, as we know, is an impossibility. They're pretty much impossible, or they were for me anyway. But then I ran across another verse of Scripture was taught that in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And understanding that, uh, that we are, or that we will continue to sin, that our world even um, is, is filled with sin and we just can't get away from it. Uh, the truths of the uh, fruits of the Spirit begin to be more and more real to me. And how Jesus wants us to love and that we serve a God of love and that he is light and in him is no darkness at all. And it is not I who live, but Christ who lives in me. All these things helped me to help us to grow as a Christian and, and to deepen our belief and to deepen our understanding. In the same way, uh, we're going to see in a micro situation, um, the story of this blind man who was born blind uh, and Jesus, whom Jesus healed. And uh, we're going to see him come in degrees to understand and to know who Jesus is and to finally worship him. So um, before we uh, get to the, the scripture and we read, let me uh, lead us in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for your guidance and for your love. We thank you for the week that we've had. Thank you for the joys that we've seen, Father, and for how you lead us and guide us. Father, we um, ask for your blessings upon this time. Father, that you open our eyes to the truths of your scripture. Father, and help us to even better understand who you are this day as we read. Uh, I pray, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. John chapter 9, beginning with verse 1. And as Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was, born, which was blind from his birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither had this man sinned nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night comes when no man can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had thus spoken, he spat on the ground and made clay of his spittle. And he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. And he said to him, Go and wash in the pool of Salam, which is by interpretation sent. 
And he went his way, therefore, and washed and came seen. As Jesus passed by, he saw a beggar. The beggars lined up around or outside of the temple, uh, hoping to um, benefit from the generosity of the people on their way or back and forth uh, to worship in the temple complex. What differentiated this man from others to whom Jesus had restored sight was this man's uh, blindness was a birth defect. Visual problems, they say, are common in this area uh, as they arise from particles of blowing sand, the bright sunlight. Uh, There's many vision problems at the time. But seeing him prompted a theological uh, discussion from, um, from the disciples, less in a compassionate way and more in a doctrinal sense uh, or as a form of uh, condemnation. Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? You see, there's got to be a reason, right, for the suffering of an individual. It brings up a lot of questions that we still have today. Why do people suffer? Is it a consequence of disobedience? Is it caused by an unjust God looking for opportunities to punish people for their failings? Or even the failings of their parents? We'll all be doomed in that respect. The Bible does not make a connection, or does make a connection between sin and suffering, but it does not connect all suffering to sin. You see, we live in a fallen world. Uh, Romans chapter 1, it says even even very nature groans and waits for uh, the return of Christ, for that final redemption. But the ideas still pers persist in our day. We heard more than one people say, haven't you? What did I do to deserve this? Or maybe you said it yourself. Was it something that I've done? Is it something that my parents did? Why am I going through this? Well, before we jump to conclusions, we need to look at all the facts and not just make an assumption on the general principle uh, that, that because of something, there's a cause and effect. Like I said, we live in a fallen world. Birth defects happen. Bad things happen to good people. Even the good people suffer. We're not told how the disciples knew this, this, this man was blind from birth, but apparently they knew. The question may be a little nonsensical to you. Was it this man who sinned in his womb? In his mother's womb? Or did the parents sin to cause this blindness to fall upon this man? You know, a lot of times the, um, the problems that we have with our offspring with our families sometimes we wonder if it's some sin that I'd done in the past that caused this problem that they're having I'm being punished for something that I did but Jesus said neither has this man sinned nor his parents it was not the outcome of sin on anyone's part suffering is not always related to personal sin Jesus continued his answer but that the works of God should be made manifest or brought to life in him. He will be a living, breathing example of the power of God. So it may bring some more questions. Especially in this case, was this man born blind that God's work of healing might be worked on him? Does that mean that God calls the blindness? No, it does not. Miracles do happen. Tragedies do happen in our life. But it would, this, in this case, provide an opportunity for a work to take place that would make known the power and the glory of God as it existed through Jesus Christ. That's what he was saying. I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night comes when no man can work. 
in another way that it could be written, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. We must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night comes when no man can work. Jesus did not deal with the cause. That wasn't the problem. That wasn't the issue. He only acknowledged the facts of the situation. Debating the cause would be useless. The fact was that the man was blind. The real concern should have been and was with Jesus. What can be done about it? Here's a ministry opportunity, an opportunity to see the mighty work of God that brings glory to his name. Opportunities must be seized. Sometimes we shake our heads at the, um, the problems of others. When we can actually do something about them, and not in this case, but you understand what I'm saying. Jesus seized the moment. He took charge of the situation. He would give man, the, this man sight, who in turn would give glory to God. When we do things, even on a small scale, or a seemingly small scale, compared to this, this the miracle that Jesus performed, do you give glory to God? Or do you say that this is from our church? This is because uh, I'm a good person. We just felt like that you needed something. Or do you give glory to God for everything that you do so that that can be passed on? So that the benefit that, the, that the, the, the one receiving your gift or the gifts that you have, receiving what it is that you have, will glorify God and not man. Jesus had said in, in John chapter 8, verse 12, he said, I am the light of the world. He contrasted himself with darkness or with the darkness that characterized the world. This mass of humankind, our commentary writer writes, who stand alienated from God and hostile to the cause of Christ. Jesus came to overwhelm the darkness with life and light. In John chapter 1, verses 4 and 5, he writes, The Word of God says, As long as I am in the world, imply a time when he would not be here. I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night comes when no man can work. There will be a time when I would not be here. And he would entrust the message of light to his followers. But Jesus went into action. Enough analysis. When he had thus spoken, he spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle. He turned saliva and dirt into an ointment. He anointed the eyes of the, mind, the, the blind man. Why he used this, this method is not explained. We just need to take it for what it is. Jesus then instructed him to go and to wash in a pool, a common pool at that time. And wash it off water. The man was sent, and he went his way, and he washed, and he came away seeing. The healing was not found in the saliva. It was not found in the dirt. It was not found in, in the, the muddy ointment. Neither way was it found in the water or the pool. Healing was the work of the Lord, affected by the obedience of the man. And see, the man could have stood up. He didn't know Jesus from anybody, and he could have stood up and... Uh, simply scraped the mud off of his eyes and shook it out, shook his head and extended his beggarly hand for another uh, gift. But that's not what he did. He did just exactly as Jesus told him to do. We don't know the reason why, only that he heard the voice of God and he obeyed. Jumping down to verse 32. And we're going to read a few verses before that in just a moment. But our writer, uh, or the uh, verse of Scripture. In our lesson day, since the world began, it was not heard that any man opened the eyes of one born blind. If this man were not of God, he could do nothing. And this is the beggar talking to, uh, or the blind man or that had just received his sight, talking with the Pharisees. You see, a series of conversations are recorded in verses 8 through 34 involving the man and his, and his amazed neighbors. The man and his inquisitioners, which were the Pharisees, and conversations between the Pharisees and the man's parents before a follow-up session between the Pharisees and this man. 
And talking with the man, the Pharisees sought to question the credibility of the one who had healed him. The man responded in unusual reasoning. Verses 28 and 29, they reviled him and said, Thou art his disciple, but we are Moses' disciples. And they go on to say, the Pharisees go on to say, We know that God has spoken to Moses. As for, his, as for this fellow, we know not from where he is. And the man answered, this man born blind answered and said unto them, Why, well, here is a marvelous thing that you know not from where it is, uh, from where he is. Yet he has opened my eyes. How is it that you could not know, he said. Verse 31, he continues, Now we know that God hears, hears not sinners, but if any man be a worshiper of God and does his will, he hears him. Since this age began, it was not heard that any man opened the eyes of the one born blind. Now, if this man were not of God, he could not do anything. He could do nothing. How bold was this low-life beggar to stand before the Pharisees and try to teach them? These paragons of righteousness. He noted what happened. It was an amazing occurrence, and even more amazing that the Pharisees didn't know this healer. And he said, what have we here? How is it that you being so wise did not know this man? He had opened the eyes of the blind. The Pharisees had called, this, called him a sinner in verses, 20, in verses 16 and in 24. Originally, the man responded by saying he was in no position to make that judgment. However, the man perceptively next raised the issue with the Pharisees that they could not deny because it was part of their own theology. We know, he said, that God doesn't listen to sinners, but if anyone is God-fearing and does his will, he listens to him. He's pointing out the fact that Jesus was that kind of man. He goes on. Since the world began, it was not heard that any man opened the eyes of one that was born blind. The key to this statement is reference to one born blind. The miracle of his case was that he never had his sight. Such a healing was unheard of, and they had no argument for the statement that was made either. The man drew the only logical conclusion. If this man were not of God, he could do Nothing. He wouldn't be able to do anything. His healer had accomplished something that no sinner could do and something that no one had ever done. Therefore, this healer must be in the right accord with God. He would not have been able to accomplish what he did. So the Pharisees chided the man for thinking that he, a sinner, could teach them anything. You see, this group only wanted the man to help build their case against Jesus. His refusal to cooperate meant that they, meant that they had no further use of him. And they cast him out in verse 34. They answered and said to him, You are altogether born in sin, and you do teach us? And so they just cast him out. They told him to get out of their sight. And he went away. Our scripture focus today picks back up in verse 35 down through 38. Jesus heard that they had cast him out. And when he had found him, he said unto him, Do you believe on the Son of God? And he answered, and he said, Who is he, Lord, that I might believe on him? And Jesus said unto him, You have both seen him, and he is talking with you. And he said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. Jesus reveals the truth about himself to this man. As for the man who had been healed of his blindness, he not only had the physical ability to see the world around him, but he also recognized a life-changing truth about Jesus, that he was from God. He did this while not in his presence. When he had found him, implies that Jesus was on the lookout for him. As it said, when Jesus heard that they had cast him out, he went to find him. 
when he had found him, he said, Do you believe on the Son of God? Do you believe on the Son of Man? Do you believe in the Messiah is what he was asking him. The man, man's answer indicates that he was more puzzled by the who than the what. He understood what had happened to him. He just didn't know the who of what Jesus was talking about. Who is it that I might worship him? I, understood, I understand what you did. I just don't understand who did it. Who do I give praise to? Who do I give honor to? Who is he, uh, Lord, that I might believe on him? Believe means to think, to be true to the point of trusting or having confidence in whatever the object of belief is. He had a desire to believe. It was the object that was missing. Who is it that he should worship? Jesus made a starting revelation to him. Thou hast both seen him, and it is he that talks to thee. You have seen him. What a word. Perhaps for the first time in this man's life, somebody said, you've already seen it. In his very short experience, he's letting the man know who he was. He who had seen nothing before with his eyes now not only saw Jesus visibly, but saw him perceptively as the anointed Redeemer. Just as God revealed himself in Jesus' as living word, he reveals himself through his spoken word and through his written word, the scriptures, to us. He said, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him there. Kneeling, falling prostate was an act of homage and, and, and obedience to show respect, to show honor, to affirm the superiority of the one being worshipped. He fell at his feet. Our commentary writer writes, Note how the man's understanding of Jesus had evolved. At first he didn't appear to know who Jesus was, then he learned his name. Later he professed him to be a prophet in verse 17. Then he confessed he believed that Jesus that he confessed he believed that Jesus came from God. Verse 33. And finally he worshiped him as the Messiah. So even if he does not fully understand the significance of his confession and homage to Jesus, he is accepting Jesus on Jesus' own terms. And he worshiped him. He understood. He knew. So it should be with all of us. Learning is more and more, uh, learning more and more about Jesus, growing in our relationship with Him, worshiping Him as the Son of God. When you look back over your life, even though it may not have been days since you've accepted Christ, but as you look back over your life as a child of God, as a worshiper of Jesus, Salvation, did you take into account the salvation that you have? Have you considered what Jesus did in your life? What a personal benefit to you. It was a work of glory to the Father. In what ways are you living to the glory of God? In what ways are you living to the glory of God? We can see that general progression from maybe not fully understanding who Jesus was to accepting him as Lord and Savior to beginning to understand the, the truths of the scripture that, that we are not supposed to live in a certain way, but we are born to newness of life. And so how do, how do we live this brand new life? We're like little children. And we begin to understand a little bit more of the scripture and a little bit more and a little bit more. And it leads us to believe, that, or leads us to understand that even, even as a brand new Christian, we weren't living the life that we were supposed to. We were saved, we were fully saved. And no man can take us out of his hand, but we were, but we were such a, in an infantile state. We didn't understand who Jesus was, and we didn't really fully understand. We still don't fully, un, fully understand how it is that we're supposed to act and to do. 
But through his scripture and through the spoken word, when we listen to when we listen to sermons and we listen to Bible studies, we begin to understand. We begin to understand that we should give glory to God through ourselves and through our obedience. When's the last time that you gave glory to God for your acts acts of obedience? Another question is, what practices in your life are leading you to know more and more about Jesus, thus helping you to know more of his love and grace and truth? When's the last time you sat down and you really fully read and tried to understand the fruits of the Spirit of God? That our bodies are a temple of the Holy Spirit and he teaches us and he leads us away from sin, leads us away from wrong. Perhaps you're dealing with anger or bitterness and unforgiveness. Perhaps it's time, or it is time, to give it all to Him. To be healed from that time or that portion of your life. I don't know what God wants to do through this message to you, but won't you just do it right now? And we confess our sins at the beginning of our understanding of Jesus Christ, at the point of our salvation. We realize that we're a sinner and we confess those sins. The Bible says if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us of those sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And in that, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He knows us inside and out and He loves us anyway. I don't know why, but He does. And he extends that love to you through the grace and mercy of the salvation found in Jesus Christ. Won't you accept that now? Even if you've already been saved, we can come to a newness of that life in Christ. And we can start living a life that is pleasing to him or more pleasing to him. Give glory to God. Let's join our hearts in a word of prayer. I want to thank you for your attendance today. Father, thank you for leading us through this, this wonderful story today, this miracle. Thank you, Father, for being so kind to us and being patient with us, Father, when we learn. Forgive us, Father, where we failed you, either by omission or by something that we choose to do. Father, help us to know more and more about you and give you praise and honor and glory for everything that you do in our life. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.